I'm not looking for candidate speak. I'm not looking for talking points. Are you ready to be real with me? Yeah. Okay. I feel like that's what we've been doing this whole time. Well, it really Every really. time I come on this podcast, it's my second time I say something that gets quoted back to me. Really? By a friend or an enemy? Not a friend. I wouldn't call it an enemy. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. How was your day? It was terrible. Okay, go on. We, so you might remember back in like winter last year, council member Chavez from Ward 9 and I worked on a series of, and along with council member Payne on a series of legislative directives at that time that were called staff directions on uh, the city's response to homelessness and um, uh, encampments. And after like a very long drawn out battle over process, um, we eventually passed a, a legislative directive. And uh, this uh, the, today, the findings from that were presented in committee. Um, and so we had a uh, like two and a half, almost three hour long conversation. It ended very it, on a really um, painful note. So I was, I was in the middle of watching that uh, before I came yeah. here and I didn't, I didn't get to finish. So I don't know how it ended. So it sounds like a terrible cliffhanger, but I'll, before we get too deep into it, I'll introduce the the show. This is the Wedge Live Podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards, and today I'm speaking with Minneapolis City Council member Aisha Chugtai, who represents me in Ward 10 on the Minneapolis City Council. Uh, and so I guess we should talk about uh, the the homelessness response report that you got from the executive branch. Did you get what you were looking for, first of all? Yes and no. I think we got a lot of information about um, the executive branches approach to um, people who experience homelessness and uh, people who live in encampments. I think it's always um, it's always really important for the the way residents experience the city um, to to be um, to be discussed in a very clear way where we understood exactly where the the um, administration's priorities are. And then I think it's, um, I think there are, there are pieces that we asked about, like, um, specific recommendations about how we, um, about how we reduce the role that police officers have in carrying out in cabinet evictions. Um, and, uh, a, a type of fiscal analysis that I think was really severely lacking. Um, so we, we asked for going back to the last, uh, three years, tell us how much money we've spent on, um, on, uh, encampment evictions. But then we also asked about, um, the, the other non-monetary, uh, costs associated with these. So, um, things like the destruction of property, like, um, the spread of um, the spread of infectious diseases um, and um, the impact on the loss to social services, things like that, that that I don't think were were addressed it today in in the discussion. Um, but you know, this is um, where we where we are. So we hear a lot about people's belongings being destroyed. That appears to be true. Why is that the case? And like how? How do we get to a point where people's belongings aren't being destroyed? So the city of St. Paul has uh, an, an approach to encampments where um, they invest a lot of time and uh, resources um, into ensuring that that as much of people's property as can be preserved um, happens. And um, we've it, it all starts with having 
uh, a fundamental belief that, that all people are, are deserving of, of dignity and of care and compassion that people who are experiencing homelessness are dealing with, uh, a lot of other systemic, um, failures and that, um, a, a compassionate and humane response is is also time consuming. Um, it's not easy, and it requires a lot of work on on behalf of those who have power and resources. So in St. Paul, they do a lot of work going into encampments, um, and as they're making the decision to um, to close down an encampment and, and move people either to a different space um, or um, into temporary and permanent shelter, that they're um, documenting what items people have with them and marking those correctly. And um, it's a really labor intensive process to go through with uh, with the person whose belongings they are and their belongings and, and document everything and make a plan for where those items are going to go and how the, the, the individual who's, who's is going to access their belongings. Um, and I think the the city's approach is is really deeply rooted in um being opposed to to incumbents existing which frankly is a rejection of of the reality of the world that we live in um homelessness is a chronic issue that that all cities of our size are struggling with um, and encampments are going to exist for the foreseeable future it takes so much time and uh so much money to build the type of infrastructure that can that can support people being permanently housed and receiving um, permanent uh, social services and support that they need. And until we get to that world, like this is this is a part of the reality that we live with. Um, And, you know, like playing whack-a-mole with people's lives, moving them from place to place isn't making the issue go away. It's just um, it's just making it go away for that specific site in that specific moment in time. I wonder if you have a clear idea of what accounts for the difference between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Is it an issue of like the way the government operates? Is it a difference in the like scale of the problem and therefore like the resources it takes to address it in a humane way? Uh, Are we taking the easy way out because it's just, it's so difficult, such a big problem. Let's just get this over with and do it in a way that, that hurts people. What do you think accounts for the difference between these two cities and the way they handle it? Political will. Simple as that. I mean, I assume Jacob Fry wants to do a good job. I, I think. I mean, I, think. I certainly, I, I believe that that's the place that I would hope at least that's the place he's approaching. It from. That's how, how I've seen him talk about it. And so if people came to him and said, here, Mayor Fry, this is a way you can do this better, hurt less people and get kudos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume he would take it. I assume he's decided, no, that's not a better way to do it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people have tried to do that. Uh, I can speak from my experience and say, I, like, I've tried to do that. Um, but, you know, he doesn't have to take my word for it. He can, like, go to the city of St. Paul where this this operation is run entirely um, by, by the by the administration and um, and look to their expertise. I I can't speak to why they haven't done that. Um, at the end of the day, the, we can just see the impact it has on our communities. So Council Member Ellison had an interesting line of, of uh, question and comment. There have been things in this institution that have frustrated me as a count early in my career that I came to an understanding of and able to give and have been able to give input on because people were patient and willing to have conversations. And this is one of these topic areas where that is not true. It feels like it's not true. Do you, do you find there are people in the administration willing to collaborate and have conversations and communicate information on this topic and others? I think it's insufficient for where we need to be, you know, and I think uh, council member Ellison's remarks were about, um, the lack of willingness from the administration to engage in really tough conversations about where we need to go 
and how we get there. And yeah, and I, I think he, he, he talked a lot about, you know, like the defensive nature of the administration on, on this issue. And, and I think, um, when the people who have all of the power to change how we do a thing are really stuck on operating the way they always have, there's, there's little that can be done to change their minds. What we can do is continue to push and continue to use the tools that are available to us and continue to hold up the industry best practices and the subject matter experts telling us how we should be doing this differently and hope that uh, the combination of all of those things is going to change the the end result. The city says they've received, uh, they cited a bunch of 311 calls and you had a comment about like, but I think what struck me was um, that I didn't see um, specific experiences documented um, from uh, the residents in encampments. Um, so, you know, we're saying, the city is saying our guiding principle is treating people with dignity and respect. Do encampment residents experience us that way? Have they told us that? Have we tried asking. Uh, the Whittier Clinic, th they had issues having an encampment near them. I think uh, the director of regulatory services said they had to close for a couple of days because of that. So how do we, how do we balance the needs of people living in homes near an encampment with the needs of people uh, living in the encampments? Like when push comes to shove, it seems like we, we are taking the needs of the people who live near the encampment uh, reacting to that. What do you say to someone who's like this, this encampment is causing a problem in my life and I don't care what you, what you need to do about it, but it needs to be fixed. That feels like what we're responding to here. We are and we aren't right. Like at, at surface level, that's what we're doing. Um, the problem is we don't address basic issues in encampments when they first form. And then these problems grow, the size of encampments might grow, the amount of scarcity that's being experienced grows. And that has a negative impact, certainly, first and foremost, for the residents that are living in encampments. But then it also impacts the people who are living nearby. So, um, uh, like, take, um, take any encampment and, and the encampment forms and, uh, there are, like very um, solvable issues that show up really early on. Um, and the city has an approach where we are, where, where, where MPD regulatory services, um, the administration broadly has a very, very hands-off approach to, um, to, to meaningfully addressing some of those livability concerns at encampments right away. Um, so there was a, a 311, um, complaint that was that was um, included in this report about Whittier Clinic. And it, there was something in there about how um, residents from encampments were walking up to the clinic and they were asking um, the, the residents from the encampment were walking up to the clinic. They were asking patients and people kind of coming in and out of the clinic to fill up their water bottles. This was perceived as a serious threat by the clinic and the clinic felt the need to shut down. So now let's like re really let's think about that. People are outside. It's hot outside. They're living outside. There's no access to fresh water. They ask for water and that is a serious safety threat, right? I'm not saying there wasn't, there weren't acts of violence that happened in the encampment at the Kmart site on 29th and Blaisdell. I'm not saying that at all. I, there was a person who lost their life there. Um, but what I am saying is like, if we do simple things like put in hand washing stations and porta potties and, um, ensure that there are, uh, like, clean needle disposals and these small things that can address some of the major livability concerns that, that, um, that compound over time, then we can both address the chronic needs of, um, residents who are living in encampments and address the serious livability concerns of residents who live, um, in houses nearby. I have the details of that uh, slide from their slideshow here. And there were three main complaints. It was 
uh, needles around the periphery of, yep. I guess, the clinic or the site right there. Uh, second point was someone tried to get into the garage, downstairs garage door at 345 in the morning. And then the third one was uh, asking patients to fill water bottles from inside the clinic uh, as patients were going inside. And so needles, right, like are an issue in our community broadly, right? And right. and certainly that increases when there is uh, an encampment. We know that um, people who experience homelessness also um, experience other, other societal like failures, right? Like, um, significant, uh, struggles with, with mental health, significant struggles with, um, addiction. Um, and there's an easy way for us to, to address the, the needles problem, both, and there's infrastructure that exists around it, right? Like we just have to make the choice to, to bring it into a space like that. So what was the bad thing that happened? I don't know. I think I saw a tweet about it, but I don't really know what happened. Can you tell us? I mean, I think there was, I think the, the, the conversation over the, the three hours was, um, heated and, uh, and it was really long. And, and sometimes when we have really long council meetings, um, you know, all of us who are sitting up there and the staff that are presenting, it, it is, it's a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of pressure. Um, people get tired. Uh, so I think that's, that's a portion of that. And then as people get more tired, they also get more, um, irritable. And then at, at the end of our, our meeting, um, I think, you know, council member Wansley was speaking, um, in her, in her closing remarks about, um, her perspective on the, um, presentation from staff, the report from staff. Um, and I think she made, a, a couple of comments like, you know, I don't think that, um, staff fully, uh, staff, um, fulfilled what was asked of them in the legislative directive. And, and she was making this argument about why we need an independent, uh, legislative department that's objectively giving us information about what policymaking could look like. Um, and, the Committee of the Whole, uh, which is where this was all happening, is chaired by Councilmember Palmasano, and I think Councilmember Palm Palmasano um, uh, tried to cut off discussion and and said that uh, that Councilmember Wansley um, uh, was um, out of order. Um, this is something that's happened a lot of times um, in in a lot of different Committee of the Whole and Council settings. And frankly, like in a lot of settings where we have the full body up there, um, I, I can just, you know, honestly, I can speak from my experience and say that uh, I've been asked to stop speaking on an issue when I'm just pointing out facts um, on the basis of decorum. And, uh, one of the points of decorum is that we shouldn't, we're not supposed to have side conversations, um, to the left of me. Right. And so when you're watching from the screen, it's, it's everybody who sits by the mayor. Right. Um, I call that the rainville section. Yeah. The rainville section. That's a, that's funny. I haven't heard that before. Um, there's side chatter and it is loud and it happens in every meeting. And I have never, um, seen our leadership hold that section accountable. I've seen really directed and personal attacks, um, just in the last month towards, um, towards council members, um, from, from that, you know, that side. And I've seen that really go unchecked by leadership. So I think, Councilmember Wansley uh, reacted by, you know, holding her her ground and saying that she had the right to 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 make remarks, um, and and that you know just got heated. I can, I think it's, I think this is uh, like a long standing problem that we saw really boil over in this moment where dissenting voices on this council um, are. Uh, are treated really poorly just for stating opinions, stating d dissenting opinions. Um, and, uh, those who align with the, with the mayor are allowed to not just state the opinions they have, but also make really targeted personal comments about those who are dissenting and just get away with it. Hmm. Yeah. 
I don't. <laughs> people should be allowed to. You're a count. You got elected to be a council member. Correct. You should be able to speak during a council meeting, even, right. even if it's slightly off topic. I'm sure it was related. I've seen this too. Paul no, Masano likes entirely on topic. That's. I, I think she was making a comment about right. um, the police department. Oh, I see where the off topic thing came in. Yeah, I think she was making a comment about the police department, and I, I think mentioned the mirror lock, and that's when. Yeah, but who who is to say? I don't know. I've seen Paul Masano policing people's comments, and like, you're not the mayor. You don't have the bully pulpit. but you can't like call WCCO and have them do two minutes on you every week. This is your time mm -hmm. to say what you think on an issue. And who cares if the meeting goes four hours? If somebody has something to say, this is their way to get it out. You know, for the 50 people who happen to be watching a YouTube. <laughs> like, I don't know what, what Paul Masano is necessarily afraid of. It's not going to get that much airtime, but it's, it's a way to communicate with the public. I, I don't think people should be so sensitive about letting people talk. Yeah, I mean, and this has been a thing like throughout throughout the term. I I, I think I have a, a really hard time understanding the the length of meetings piece. Um, you know, the the legislature meets. There there are times of year uh, historically when like session goes on for 15 hours and until three o'clock in the morning. Uh, recently that's happened a lot and uh, far more people pay attention to what's happening there and far more people um, have to, to go longer distances to, to get to their work, to watch along. Um, and there's a commitment to doing the people's work. Um, that's, that's like deeply, deeply felt over there. And I, I don't think that, I don't think my colleagues aren't committed to doing the, the people's work. I think that this isn't about how long meetings go. It's about the airtime that dissenting voices have to, to state their opinions. And we have the right to do, of course, because we have election certificate, because people elected us, because we represent, um, you know, 35,000 people. Uh, Can I interrupt you and scold you with a Lisa Goodman soundbite? Oh my God, I'm so lucky. And I feel like uh, everyone's time is being taken up, including all of the people in the audience. Uh, we're 22 minutes into this and we haven't gotten hardly past the, my first question. It was it meant to be lighthearted? How was oh. your day? And it turned into <laughs> this. <laughs> so uh, caucus and convention season, uh, one of the reasons, I think the only reason you're here is because I'm an uncommitted delegate and uh, you were sending emails around, like trying to set up meetings with delegates. Uh -huh. And I said, Hey, I have a podcast. You need to come on my podcast. That's how you win my vote. So uh, that's not what happened. For the record, know? that's like literally not what happened. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you didn't yeah, respond but... to my email and yeah. then you sent a separate email um, asking for my time. So just for the record, you, um, yeah. all of that is true, happened. right? I made most of that up. Uh, John Edwards, the person, completely ignored your email from I should yes, chuck down the candidate. Uh, John Edwards, the newsman, sent you a separate email asking you to come on the podcast. But seeing as how we are actually the same person, and you can't you can't block off in your mind that I am a delegate, because how many delegates are there? Three hundred and some which makes me a very important person. So my question to you is how are you going to win my support at the convention? How am I going to win your support at the convention? Um, uh, by asking for it. Okay. You don't have it. You're not going to pander to me in any way. You don't, do you have a file? Do you have a file on voter on p delegates? Like this is what they like. This is what I should say to them. Is there like a spreadsheet oh, where in one of the there columns... There is a spreadsheet of who all the delegates are. Uh, like, do you have a column set aside for this person is terrible? <laughs> <laughs> this person has bad opinions. So be careful. Um, no, I think okay. we we do what all campaigns do. We like have a, a spreadsheet of who all the delegates are and who they're supporting. And when we contact them and um and i guess we just do that for a little while okay are you, are you doing well are you getting a good response you're you have an opponent who i can't can't seem to nail down what's Neither going on with your opponent what your opponent's how your opponent's name is spelled the website is constantly down i'd like to learn more about this person uh nazri warsame 
is his name, mm-hmm. did very well on caucus night. Didn't know about him before caucus day, basically, but did very well. Can you yep. tell me anything about him? Um, he's running. Okay. Um, Edina resident Alicia Gibson supports him. You knew you, that's the way to my heart. <laughs> um, I met him once when we did delegate selection. It was my first time meeting him. So he does exist. Okay. Yeah. Yes. He certainly exists. He's certainly a person. <laughs> okay. There's no prank happening. This is like a real person who's actually running. Um, yeah. Okay. Delegates, uh, or, or I think caucuses, uh, and the delegate work is going well. Um, I feel good about where things stand right now. Um, there's like about a month worth of work to do before our in-person convention. I'm kind of excited about an in-person convention. Last time we had a Google form to fill out. Uh, Me too. So that'll be fun. We're screen printing shirts. So the news out of Ward 5 and Ward 6 is there's a lot of phony delegates floating around. Are you confident in the integrity of the process here in Ward 10? Are all these delegates real? I guess we'll, we'll find out, right? Um, it, it's it's my it's always um, my instinct is to always believe that when people are participating in a process and they are saying, telling us who they are and who they support, that we should believe them. Um, and... I think uh, the types of issues that we saw in Ward 5 are pretty similar to the ones that we've seen in in Ward 10 um, from the the information that I've seen circulated um, uh, within the DFL. And then I know some of it made its way online. I'm excited to meet the people that are that are supporting um, Nasri and get to understand the the issues they care about deeply and um, hopefully continue representing them at city hall and ensure that the, that their concerns and their needs are, are met as well. Let's, let's talk about Brian Avenue. Let's now, do it. I'm are, so are shocked. Ready? That wasn't your opening question. I think I was so thrown off by that. Well, I tried to just ask you how your day was <laughs> and you sidetracked me. It was going to be early on in the podcast. Now people have to wait a half an hour in. Right. Uh, now, now that Public Works has gone their own way on Bryan Ave, uh, <clears throat> should Minneapolis residents have confidence that the public engagement process, council approval process of street reconstructions, that any of that matters anymore? Because the city council approved uh, a Bryan Avenue design in 2021, uh, and Public Works has gone their own way. They've axed the chicanes. They have moved the, the bike lane closer to the street. We're losing some green space. I think it's substantially changed and should have had council reapproval. I also think like telling people a week before construction starts is awful. So I, d- I have lost faith in the process for street reconstructions. I think that it is incredibly frustrating um, to engage in good faith in a process and uh do your part and like participate in local government, local democracy and see it through to an outcome only for that outcome to change last minute. Um, I think feeling jaded about participation in, in, in street reconstruction projects and public input, though, that's a, that's a really fair way to, to feel. Um, and I just like, I really think, about the hundreds of people that came in to testify on, on drones, MPD, like using drones and nearly every single person, right? Like we're not talking about an 80, 20 split, like almost every single person and almost every single comment that came in opposed MPD using drones and they did it anyway. And, uh, I think about the, the, the people that came in, particularly city staff who currently worked at the city, um, who risked losing their jobs and having their careers destroyed, um, to testify against the appointment of, of Heather Johnston at that time as the, the city coordinator. And like the amount of like 
the the amount of work and and bravery it took to do that. And in both of those examples, the the people who chose to participate didn't get the outcome they wanted. And historically in the anti-police crimes work, that has been the case for decades, right? People asking for for accountability for for justice and and just not getting it. Um but they choose to show up anyway because uh because this is about their it's about our lives, it's about their lives, it's about the things that um that people deserve. And uh I think especially from serving in a minority, I, I often think about like when we don't when we can't get to the the outcome that we want, the least we can do is be transparent with the public. The least we can do is advocate for the outcome that we want. Um, and the least we can do is, is help the, the people who are impacted most deeply by this issue know that they're not alone. Um, that's how we build community. That's how we build solidarity. That's how we build a world where the outcomes we want actually happen. Um, and short of doing that, we, we leave the world and, and decision making power to those who have the most of it and those who benefit the most from the way things are right now, um, to do whatever they want to. Um, and that isn't acceptable to me. It's not acceptable to a lot of people. Um, and as, as like, as, as righteous as being frustrated and jaded is continuing to show up and continuing to hold, um, this administration accountable is critical. We're, we're never going to see anything happen differently if we don't. So what, what is your recourse? Because there's an ordinance that says city council controls the streets. Public Works says, well, this is not a substantial change. Therefore, we can just move, move in our own direction. What if you disagree? What if the council disagrees with that? What is your recourse to fix it? If the mayor is doing something you think is taking your power away, something that belongs to you as an elected body, what can you do? Um, I think on this council, we haven't seen a majority of the body, certainly not a veto proof majority, have the political will to act, um, act differently and to, um, hold the line in maintaining our power, which we have certainly have the, the right to do. Um, I think on, on Bryant Avenue, and in in street reconstruction projects like this moving forward, this is a political choice. The council, as the majority of the council, can assert our authority here. The fact that it's not happening is a is a choice that's being made. I've been I've been you know pushing for the director of public works uh, for Margaret Anderson Kelleher to come in and present in a in a public setting um, something that I've repeatedly asked her to do um, and her department to do on this on this project. Um, I'm going to keep doing that. I think it's important for them to come in and show us exactly. Um, why they're making these changes, um, and make sure that that is justified by facts, um, and not anecdotes. I had a really productive conversation with our city attorney's office today. And the, the big lesson I learned from it, um, is like, this is a political choice. So by political choice, you mean silently and without a vote, the council majority is going to let it go and therefore... It's just the way the city operates now. Nobody... Well, the chair of public works could ask the director to bring the item in front of council and ask for a vote. Andrew Johnson, I know you listen. We're, we're calling you out. <laughs> uh, hold this public works director accountable, Andrew Johnson. He's also out of town. so oh, He'll still be listening. You can get the oh, podcast yes. when you're out of town. Uh <laughs> So have you learned anything in particular? I'm looking for a kernel of wisdom. I'm not looking for candidate speak. I'm not looking for talking points. Are you ready to be real with me? Yeah. Okay. I feel like that's what we've been doing this whole time. Well, it really Every time real. I come on this podcast, it's my second time I say something that gets quoted back to me. Really? By a friend or an enemy? Not a friend. I wouldn't call it an enemy. <laughs> really? I got you to, to say something controversial? <laughs> Extremely controversial last time. <laughs> okay. Just listen closer think, to your answers was, and follow have you up. Met right with, <laughs> I think that's what I said. Oh. <laughs> wasn't it Alicia Gibson, was it? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, 
I was going to ask, have you learned anything? You are a year and three months into doing this job. What do we not know? What do I, what do people on the outside of city hall not know about city hall or your job that would be interesting to us or helpful in understanding what's going on? And again, no political answers it has to be real. Like, Prior to my time at City Hall, I really didn't think that, like, the whole call, email, your council member thing was effective at all. Like, I just thought it was, like, the thing that we did to direct anger. Um, it has such an impact. Like, every day I hear from an office, we're right by the kitchen, um, so we hear everything. Every day I hear about aides and members talking about, like, how they're dealing with like these 10 emails they got from somebody about some issue. So I think there's, there's something about like the amount of power that residents have and uh, the need for that to, the, the need for that to shift. I think um, like people with the most amount of access usually are the ones that are contacting their council offices and that informs decision-making and it does in a really serious way. Everything inside City Hall is just really deeply political. Um, and there's, which isn't something you don't know, right? Like, and, right. Uh, yeah. It's the thing about this new government structure. It feels like technically City Council is supposed to hold the mayor accountable, right? Checks and balances, two branches of government. We've given the mayor so much power that he has so much leverage over every council member. Like, you want this thing that you want to make happen? Well, uh, make friends with me. Be nice to me. Is uh, Am I right in assuming that's the dynamic? Like, uh, the incentive structure is play nice with the mayor and you can have what you want. Otherwise, you're kind of out of luck. Hmm. No, I mean, we have power. Uh, we have real legislative power and right now it isn't play nice with the mayor and you'll get what you want it's vote with the mayor and you'll get what you want and so if you represent a community that disagrees with the 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 direction of the administration it's your responsibility to do what your community wants right it's my responsibility to do the things that ward 10 residents want and need um and that happens to not align with the mayor and I'm not going to to vote with him on the things that he wants just so I can get get things. I'm not going to, right? Um and this dynamic can shift with a with a council that has the courage and the will to assert its authority and power and use its legislative um authority, its budgetary authority to actually to do work on behalf of the people. And I think we've seen a tremendous shift from the last council to this one in in the willingness of council members to take dissenting votes and the willingness of council members to um, speak truth about, uh, about uncomfortable things um, and not worry so much about retaliation. And I think the next step from here is is having a council that's both willing to do that and has the the votes to, you know, win. So I think I hear the distinction you're making is like, if the council would assert its power, then the balance of power would shift. Correct. And uh, I, so I saw this pitch on your website. I haven't read every candidate website this year and not a lot of incumbents, <laughs> but I did see this that I have not seen a lot of people, this argument from candidates And let me read it. Uh, It's a pitch for electing a progressive council majority. It is clear that the conservative majority on the city council does not share the values of our collective movements. That's why I'm dedicated to not only winning re-election, but also coming back with a progressive majority in 2024. So what what are the things you, you think would you could accomplish as a city council together with a progressive city council majority? What do you want to get done? I, I want to fund, um, more alternatives to, to, um, public safety. I, um, want to 
I want to pass fair scheduling. Um, I want a humane and compassionate encampment response. Uh, I want to permanently fund co-enforcement um, for, uh, for, for labor violations. Um, I want to make sure that we expand, um, like dedicated bus lanes, uh, something I think Elizabeth Glidden tried to do way back, uh, when. I want to see us actually do the work that advances our, our community's goals and, and vision. Um, like the, the, everything from how we revitalize, um, our, our commercial corridors by investing in people and investing in the infrastructure that we need to do that work. Um, is just all so important, right? In the next couple of years, we're going to decide exactly what the future of Kmart is going to look like. That's going to dramatically shift um, what Ward 10 looks and feels like for generations. Um, I want that plan to center anti-displacement and to be um, built for the, the young people the immigrant families, the renters that live here right now and deserve to live here um, for generations. So talking about uh, alternative responses, public safety, has something like the behavioral crisis response team been held back for a lack of resources? Because I hear two things. One is we've got a we got a bunch of broken vans and we can't do our jobs because we have broken vans. That's a, like a resources question. And also I've heard about... Uh, from uh, Brian Smith, who runs, I forget what the name of the the department is now, and performance management innovation, that it's, just, it's difficult to hire people to staff those nights and weekends, or maybe it's just weekend nights. So if, if you just, if you had that progressive majority to fund some of these programs at a higher level, could you ramp them up? Like, are, are resources the problem? And it, we could hand them more resources and ramp up, or is it just a question of we need time to scale these things up? Resources are certainly a part of the problem, right? Like when, like the take the behavioral crisis response team as an example, it was an incredibly successful pilot. Um, a part of the reason it took so long to scale, it's taken long to scale up and actually have the um, have the. Uh, the program take all of the 911 calls that come in that they're qualified to take. Um, it's, it's, it's a resource problem, but like, if we want to have, um, 24 seven coverage where the BCR team is taking every single phone call, uh, every single, uh, 911 call, um, that they, that they can, that they're legally, uh, able to, we have to invest in that now, right? In order for that to be a reality three years from now. There's, there's the, the like amount of time it takes to buy more vans and get them staffed and place them in the correct spaces, right? Like we're, there's no such thing, uh, as wanting to go in a direction and getting there overnight. But like, if we want to go in a direction, we have to invest in it and, nurture it and foster it every step of the way. And like, that's how we get there. Um, but one in five 911 calls for service are ones that could be, uh, that state statute allows for a non, uh, armed police responder to take one in five. Uh, the BCR, uh, program is an example of one alternative program that takes some of those calls. There's other programs that could exist. Um, but we have to do the work to pilot those. We have to do the work to, um, figure out exactly what that's going to look like and test and scale. And that stuff takes time. But if we're not investing in it today, we're certainly not going to get to it soon. Okay. We're getting very late here. And so short answers, please. Okay. <laughs> as, we, as we go on. Is I'm going to ask no I mean, questions like that. I, I've been trying to figure out, like, what's the public safety debate? Is it is it really just the question of resources? Like, uh, we could add more of these programs 
if we had more resources, elect a council, a progressive city council this year to do that, because it seems like police budget is $200 million. Seems like it will always be $200 million, no matter what happens. Seems like we will always be hundreds of officers below the, uh, the minimum. It doesn't seem like anything that happens matter, at least for the foreseeable future. Like these things feel like immutable realities. And so is the public safety debate about funding these other things? Is that like when people go to vote for city council, what they should be thinking of on public safety? Yeah. And I think it's like uh, making sure that the consent decree is successful and some of the really important reforms that are in it actually being implemented within the police department. Uh, I'm sorry for scolding you about your answer. Like, no, no, that no. Was, that was more, <laughs> that was more like an admonishment of As myself. you can tell, I'm rusty. How do you assess the success of Operation Endeavor? Because I see it touted everywhere, especially on TV. Uh, and again, like we've got fewer officers than ever. Crime rates going down. I, what are they doing? What are they doing that they weren't doing before? I, I don't know. It feels like the crime rates go up and down for a lot of reasons unrelated to like Operation Endeavor. So I don't know if we should be celebrating it necessarily. How do you assess it? Uh, crime rates go up and down for a lot of different reasons. Um, and if we fundamentally believe that, that safety is not, um, is not, uh, a product of policing, um, then, then where public safety is right now, it has to do with so many factors. We can't attribute it to just one. I think there's something odd about just like, yeah, I think, I think crime is down for a lot of different reasons. Are you good friends with the chief? I, I saw you went. Did you go on a walk with him? Coffee? I remember that interaction you had with the chief <laughs> when he first arrived. Uh, do you like the chief? Um, I think he is. I think he is somebody who takes reform within the police department really seriously. Um, and and I've seen a commitment to that beyond um, just words. That's generally what we see from this administration it's refreshing to have a police chief that sees reform as actual difficult work to do um i hope he's successful in that for all of our sake <clears throat> is the work uh, of creating a fully functional legislative branch happening fast enough uh, no. what would you like to see happen now more money more staff uh, more uh, more assertive like budgeting from the council majority mm -hmm. more money more staff we should also just look to other cities that um, have functional legislative departments and how those operate. Like we don't have to reinvent the wheel on every single thing that the city does. Like we can just like look to other people who are doing it successfully. I spoke to someone who worked for a council member in New York City, and he was telling me about. I spoke to him like, too. I know exactly who. Uh, you spoke to this person too. This guy <laughs> yeah. gets around. If, uh, he used to be a constituent. Some. A crazy number of uh, staff, each council member. And I think they have a bigger city council, too. So, Correct. Okay. Rent control. Is that coming through this year? Are we going to see that on the ballot? Uh, I'm going to do everything we can I can and uh, organize my colleagues to do everything we can to put rent control on the ballot this year. Um, I think the administration would like to not see that happen. I make him veto it, council majority. Make him veto it. Put something on the back. Uh, you've read my mind. Hmm. Yes. It doesn't seem, you don't seem very optimistic about that though. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's been, it's been like really, really difficult to get the administration to take um, implementation of tenant opportunity to purchase really seriously, take uh, moving work on rent control really seriously um, or encampment response seriously. I think that's the, the reality right now. Um, but we still have to do our work within it. Do you have any recommendations? I think we're at the end or, or did we not cover anything? Is there anything you came here today and you're like, gee, I hope John really asked me this question. I'd love to just go off on this. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I was like, Sure, we would talk about Bryant Avenue, but I think that was okay. all I left in with. I thought you would ask me, like, I remember my last one, we did these, like, rapid fire section at the end. I should I should have a rapid fire section because I 
can't control the length of time that these go on at all. I have no power to to like decide oh, I'm going to do a 40 minute podcast. Yeah, That's what I'm going to do. The city council right now. You certainly have the power. <laughs> you, this is your show. It's true. You assert timelines. Yeah. I so can, can you put in a good hold me word? accountable. I should. I should hold you accountable. You were mm-hmm. violating my decorum. By... Correct. <laughs> but then you uh, have to tell you... me what decorum is. Can you put in a good word with Linnea? Are you in a position to put in a good word with Linnea Palmasano? I've been doing this video campaign where I get celebrities from around the city to say, Linnea Palmasano, please come on the Wedge Live podcast. I don't know if you want to like... Why does she not want to come on the Wedge Live podcast? I don't know. She won't respond to my emails. I mean, I've said unflattering things that I think were substantive about her, uh, mostly. So, I mean, I can see why she sees me as a hostile potential interviewer, but I won't, I'm not hostile, at least in these pod, this podcast format. I'm not here to, like, argue with people. Uh, no, so. I don't think that, I don't think you're combative like that. Yeah. I, people probably think I'm very lame and soft and terrible. So... Uh, I'm, I'm just your style. Could you put in a good word? Are you in a position to do that? Are you on friendly terms? This may not, you may not be. I am on friendly terms, um, but I'll do you one better. Um, I am not going to make a pitch on this podcast right now to her, <laughs> but I will ask her about it for you. Okay. I don't want you to burn a lot of political capital on this. I won't. Not. I won't. I'm sorry. Yeah. If I'm going to burn political capital on something, it'll be rent control. So I think you'll have to take a second. Yeah. You could even drop a line like, I can't vouch for this guy. <laughs> but he's a delegate. He's a delegate. And I promised I would pass this on. I can't vouch for him at all. Is that the way that I get, get your support? <laughs> yeah. I don't want you to burn any political capital on this. I don't want it to <laughs> blow back on you at all if it goes poorly. Okay. It's time for recommendations. Anything you're enjoying uh, particularly? What's bringing you joy? I've been sitting on my porch a lot. It's done wonders for my, for my health. Hmm. Um, I have a new hair care routine. I don't know if you're interested in that. Hey, let's talk about hair care. Really? Okay. What, what is the, what is the new hair care Are routine? Are you serious? Is it designed oh to God. solve a particular problem or is it just... Adding. Okay. First of all, you you must have never had long hair. Were you not one of those white guys that like grew out your hair like in college? No, no, oh, I did never do. Um, okay, so as you can see, I have really long hair, right? Um, and uh, I also have a very stressful job, so I have a hard time taking ca- good care of it. Um, so I've uh, when I was a kid, my mom used to put like this like blue coconut oil, like the, the container was blue and the coconut oil wasn't blue. Um, in my hair and then she'd braid it and, and whatever. And then I stopped doing that. Um, and so I, I found it at, um, at like the Indian grocery store the other day. And so I'm putting that in my hair again. Uh, I have this like, these rosemary essential oils, fenugreek oil that I'm putting in my hair regularly to take care of it. I stress goes to my hair. So I've been losing a lot of my hair in the last year and, and I've been graying a lot. It's really, I I was going to say, I noticed that on the, at the meeting, I saw like one stray gray and like anyone else, I wouldn't really notice it, but you are very youthful. Yeah, it's all here, as you can see. I don't know. The, oh. the sunlight makes it hard. But yeah, no, I have a lot of gray hairs. My mom grayed when she was like, by the time she was 30, her hair was like all white, half white. Here's a personal question. Are you just going to let it go? Are you going to be one of those people like... Oh, absolutely. Ah, I, I love I love that. I love okay, my gray good. hair. I love that it so, ages. Absolutely. Set a good example for people not to be so concerned about signs of aging. It's not a big deal. Um, I fully support people doing things that are fun to their hair, like coloring it for whatever purposes that they would like, whether it's anti-aging or because they like the color that they're putting in it for other reasons. Um, I support other anti-aging things that people do. Um, I used to joke about doing 
like getting Botox by the time I turned 25, uh, forever. Um, I'm too busy. I'm 25 right now. I'm too busy. I can't go in for that. Um, but very pro making changes for whatever reason you want to. Probably <laughs> includes coloring your hair and getting yeah. Botox. I thought we were going to be like all proud of, <laughs> of getting older, but now you've turned it into like a pro plastic surgery pitch here at the end. No, it's pro bodily autonomy, John. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see you Rich coming back. Rich includes plastic surgery. I don't want to see you coming back with big lips to a council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see that. <laughs> uh, okay, where's where's the Indian grocery store that we can go and? and um, I've I I've, I've grown up going to uh, Little India in Northeast. It used to be Patel Groceries. Thank you for spending your hour with me during uh, DFL endorsement season. Uh, I go back and make some Are you more phone calls. Uh, I will be supporting you. Well, no, I can't say that because I want uh, Nasri Warsame to come on the podcast. Well, oh, should I do a pitch for him? If you want to, do you want to do a pitch for your opponent to come on the Wedge Live podcast? I don't know how persuasive that will be. Well, I don't know that it's going to be persuasive for you to keep doing what you're doing either. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. If it hasn't worked yet, you have to change tactics. Deliver straight to camera to your <laughs> opponent, Nasri Morsame, to come on and speak to someone who's admitted they're supporting you uh, at the convention, which I will cut Great. out of the episode. Great. Love that for you. Um, Nasri, I think you should come on the Wedge Live podcast and spend an hour with John talking about your vision for Word 10. Uh, when I first ran in 2021, John did not support me, and I did come on the podcast, and I had a lovely time. And sometimes it's important to go on the Wedge Live podcast, even if you know that the host is not supporting you. <laughs> some, some say that launched you uh, to superstardom. Thank you. <laughs> taking that risk. Taking that risk. Okay. Thank you for that. That's That will go up on Twitter, uh, I think. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be there like later today. <laughs> okay. Uh, my guest has been War 10 City Council member here in Minneapolis, Aisha Chugtai. Thank you again. This has been the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.